Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, Happy New Year! And no, I'm, I'm not confused, um, terribly, terribly confused, although it may seem like it. But today is New Year's Day. That is in the life of the church. For today is the first Sunday of Advent, the beginning of the church calendar. And so if you are done with 2020 and oh so ready for it to be over, rejoice for you can jump into this season wholeheartedly as the beginning of something new. And then you can celebrate again on January 1st as we enter into 2021. But for now, we are entering into the season of Advent. We are entering into the season of Christmas and Epiphany. And we observe Advent on the four Sundays prior to Christmas Day. The word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, meaning coming. It's a time to prepare. It's a time to get ready for the coming of Christ in all of the ways that we understand that. For we celebrate the coming of the Messiah, the one who the Jewish people had been waiting for for so very long. We celebrate the coming of Jesus, born in Bethlehem. We celebrate the promise of the risen Christ coming again one day in final victory. And we celebrate the continual coming of Christ into our hearts and into our lives. Now I was wondering this past week, what might be some of your favorite Christmas memories? What are some of your strongest memories of the Christmas season? For some of us, it might be some of those childhood memories that come to mind. For others, it might be uh, the traditions and the times that we've spent with our children and with our grandchildren. Now, a vivid memory for me has nothing to do with giving cookies to Santa or uh, the more current trend of Elf on a Shelf. Um, and I heard of something this week called Mary on the Mantle. Uh, but for me, my most vivid memory was that sense of anticipatory waiting. Because it did not matter how early we woke up on Christmas morning. It did not matter how tantalizing the smells were coming from the kitchen. Uh, my siblings and I, we were not allowed downstairs until everyone was ready. So my two brothers, my sister and I, we would wait. We would wait at the top of the stairs, waiting for that moment where we all could go down together. And we would rush through the living room, straight past the brightly lit Christmas tree with all of the presents below, past the little wooden nativity scene that sat on the coffee table. And we would flock into the den where we each could, could look into our own stocking. And gifts would come later in the day after a delicious brunch and after our grandparents would come over to celebrate. And so for me, Christmas has always had that, that it's always been tinged with that anticipatory waiting, that expectation that comes from almost being there and waiting, but not quite yet, but knowing that something wonderful is in store. And that is what the season of Advent is all about. However, unlike the, the happy memories that we, we have associated with our childhoods oftentimes and over the years, our scriptures this morning, they lead us to look at Advent with a bit more of a nuanced view. For while this season is a time of expectation, it's that time where we lift up that hope for the future we also are in a time where that expectation is tinged with the recognition of the turmoil, of the suffering that's happening in the here and now. And so for the prophet Isaiah that we heard this morning, we hear his cry and he says, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Across this Advent season, the texts 
of Scripture speak of a people asking, Where are you, God? How long? When are you coming? Come now. And I think that this is the year where those cries of the heart speak in profound ways to us. Because we have experienced a year of asking, how long? How long will our lives be upended? How long will we be separated from family? How many lives will be lost? How many families will have to experience a first Christmas without a loved one? Today, as we enter into this journey of Advent, we are beginning a sermon series called Those Who Dream. And this is inspired by a wonderful resource called Sanctified Art. And they were inspired by looking at Psalm 126. The words of the psalmist open this psalm by, by claiming, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. What a beautiful sentiment. This is a season to think about what it looks like to be as one who dreams. For the prophets, the psalmists, Joseph, John the Baptist, Mary, Elizabeth, Simeon, Anna, the shepherds, the magi, they were all dreamers. They received and discovered and responded to God's dreams for the world. And in Advent, we step into the mystery and awe of God's dreams, and we pray for those dreams to become our reality. Now, ironically enough, this week, as we begin this sermon series on those who dream, we are starting off with the idea of keeping awake. For those who dream, do not fall asleep to the realities of the world. God prompts us to pay attention to where God's dreams for change and new life are emerging. In Advent, we remember that, that God's ultimate dream is to be intimately connected with us, to come down and dwell among us. And as we keep awake, we join Isaiah, we join the psalmist in pleading for restoration and asking for God to draw near. And so we look forward to a new year, and in doing so, we are invited to start by looking at the end. The church tells the Christian story beginning with recounting the last things, keeping awake for the end days. Our passage from the Gospel of Mark this morning is often called the Little Apocalypse. And we're taken to Jesus, who as an adult is both offering this prophetic judgment, but also uh, these words of comfort. Verse 24. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now, it may, be, it may seem a little bit strange to begin our anticipation of the birth of Jesus with this text, which is encouraging us to wait for his coming again. Strange enough to begin the story with the ending. Now, I must confess, I am one of those weird people who appreciates knowing the end of the story before I actually read it or watch it. I like to know what I'm getting into, but I do recognize for many of you that's like the worst thing ever. Spoilers are not something to be tolerated. But for us today, starting at the end makes sense. It makes sense for us because when we focus on our anticipation of the resurrected Christ, then we find ourselves in that same space as those who were long awaiting the birth of the Messiah. For we know when we are going to celebrate Christmas, right? I mean, we have it on our calendars. It's pretty clearly marked year after year. 
But if we enter that new space of looking and anticipating Christ's coming again into our hearts, into our lives, and in the end days, that call to keep alert, that call to keep awake, takes on a deeper meaning for us. And so Jesus goes on in our text this morning to share a parable about a fig tree. Verse 28, from the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as the branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, This generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In reading this text this morning, I think that there are two things that we should probably talk about. Apocalyptical literature and figs. Two things uh, I would guess that, that you don't often talk about in your everyday conversations. But apocalyptic is from a Greek word simply meaning revelation. It refers to the thoughts and the literature that deals with eschatology, which is end times or future judgment. And oftentimes the literature that's considered apocalyptic is the writing down of divine revelations that people have have had coming through visions. Now from the perspective of Mark's audience, The Gospel of Mark was written to a Jewish audience around the year 70 CE, and this text would have resonated strongly with them. For it was during this time that there was a Jewish revolt against Rome, and there was the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And apocalyptic literature fills a number of different roles, but one of those is being ambiguous enough to apply to many circumstances not meant to predict specific events in the future. The purpose is to understand God's mighty acts in the past as a framework for understanding how God's people should respond in the present. And I think that's so important. The purpose of this particular type of literature is to understand God's mighty acts in the past as a framework for understanding how the people of God should respond in the present. Now, it can be tempting to look at these uh, apocalyptical books of the Bible, such as Daniel and Revelation, and try to puzzle them out like a code for the future. I mean, we've seen the popularity of books and films such as Left Behind, and we certainly see the fascination that we have with dystopian or, or doomsday stories in all kinds of our our current films and books. There's this appeal for the unknown and what lies ahead, and maybe an even intriguing fear that piques our curiosity. Now, according to Christopher Hudson in the Feasting on the Word commentary, the basic message of apocalyptic visions is this. The rebellion against God is strong against God's reign is strong as the wicked oppress the righteous. Things will get worse before they get better. But hang on just a little longer because just when you are sure that you cannot endure, God intervenes to turn the world right side up. So that's apocalyptic literature. What about figs? What is up with this little parable tucked in there about a fig tree? For those of us who live in an industrialized world and in the 21st century, most of us, we are pretty disconnected from the land. We don't experience those rhythms of the harvest or those small intricate signs from nature as to the changing of the seasons. But for those who Jesus is talking to, they were attuned to every little thing like that. Lillian Daniel writes this, an agricultural natural image pulls no punches. The seasons passed and the fig tree's growth follows an order. But that fig tree is fragile itself. Some figs will not make it. They simply will not flourish. She goes on to say that staying awake matters. 
not so much to protect ourselves, but to notice the beauty of the moment. By staying awake, we may catch that second when the branch is tender and learn that summer is near. By staying awake, we may be there to see the master who arrives when we are least expecting it. And so Jesus concludes in our text this morning by saying this, but about that day or that hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man who's going on a journey. When he leaves home, he puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and he commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, at midnight, at the cock crow, or at dawn. Or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. So what does keeping awake look like during Advent of 2020? Because most of us are tired in ways that we have never experienced before. Unlike other years where we are exhausted from running around from all of the preparations of the season and the gift buying, we find ourselves in a different place this year, in a different space. We are facing a new safer at home order starting on Monday, and we are being asked to dig deep once again to, as much as possible to stay home. Well, I think that our texts this morning give us some guiding light because they encourage us to look to God's faithfulness and works in the past to give us guidance in our lives today. We are invited to look around at the small things that indicate God's presence. Now, this past July, I was supposed to go on a pilgrimage to a small town in Germany called Oberammergau to see a passion play. Now, the story goes that back in the 1600s, during the Thirty Year War, the bubonic plague was devastating Bavaria. Now, Oberammergau did not have a single case of this sickness until 1633, when a man returned home after working at a nearby village. And after coming home over the next month or so, half of the village, 88 people, would die. And so the people of this village decided to go before God and to take a vow. And they asked God, they said, if they would be spared from this plague, they would share a play every 10 years telling about the life and death of Jesus. And the story goes that no further lives were lost to that plague. And so starting in 1634, the first play was performed. Now this play takes over 2,000 people to put on, and all of them must be residents of this village. It's over a five hour production. And while it's been postponed a few times, uh, the play was canceled only once in 1770 after all of the passion plays were banned at the time. Uh, and the town got a, an exemption shortly after that. And it was canceled one other time in 1940 due to World War II. And now this past year in 2020, it was postponed once again due to a plague. And to be honest, I was very disappointed not to be able to go this year. It wasn't in my plans. It wasn't how I had envisioned this year to go. Uh, but when I stopped and thought about it, I realized, uh, when has any year of my life ever gone completely to plan? It just doesn't happen. It doesn't work that way. And I, and I realized how wonderful to, uh, to be reminded that God was with this small village during a terrible, terrible time. And this village was given a vision for the future. And they've grown stronger together all of these centuries later. Over 400 years, they are still remembering a time that God was with them. And they are sharing that message with the world, a message of hope. While we enter into this season of Advent, as we enter into this space of waiting, may we remember to be alert, 
to keep awake. May we keep awake to the beauty and the signs of God's creation. May we remember God's faithfulness through the ages. May we witness God's presence here with us. And who knows, maybe this strange season, this unique year, this might be a reminder. This year might be the one we lift up in the years ahead to remember a time where we were able to reflect and grow and live into a time of faith. May it be so. Amen.